Hopefulness 2.0. It's Saturday, um, let's say May 25th. I don't think that's the truth. Uh, no, no, it's the 28th. Duh, I should know this. I filled out like <sighs> at least 10 different documents with that date. So I should know that by now. But, you know, I just got home. I'm tired. Hold on, I'm going to close the door. email that I send, not only the date itself, but then there's like, since it's essentially a copy-paste kind of thing, and then makes necessary adjustments, um, the title of the actual email, you know, the subject, and then there's the, um, the like, at least I want to say three, possibly four, just within that email, I got to change the dates up. And then uh, I got to do the same for a number of different documents. Because, you know, bed census and, you know, testing schedule and, head, you know, is it a head count? And, uh, what is it? Uh, blood pressure. So there's all kinds of stuff I got to do. Um, and... kinds of stuff I gotta do. I gotta clean up dishes and I gotta dirty some more dishes. Make some rice, make some chicken. But I was gonna take around on the computer today. I brought it with me, but I forgot to bring my mouse with me. So I really couldn't do anything with it. I did uh, watch trimmers though. Movie still holds up pretty well. I mean, like, the crazy thing is, is like, yeah, there's a little bit of like, uh, what's you could say it's either misogyny or sexism with uh, Kevin Bacon's character, because you know, like, he just wants you're you're sort of. Hot, blonde, you know, Aryan girl, if you will. Um, and call it a product of its time or whatever. But at the very least, it's seemingly, it's called out. Um, Now, yeah, admittedly, there's very little representation in the film. There's a bunch of white people, and, you know, mostly men, and... One Latino dude that I can recall, and one Asian dude. If I'm not mistaken... Well, I know at least one of those two guys. I think it's the Asian dude. I can't remember. It's been a while. It's been several hours, <laughs> which is a while for me. <clears throat> now I've been watching Uncle Roger a lot, and he's like, "Just wash your rice in here," and I'm like, "I don't want to." Why are you using a colander? I'm like, you know what? I like it. I prefer the colander method. It is, in my opinion, easier. It makes more sense. And all I have to do really is just rinse the damn thing off. It's not that big of a deal. You know, am I going to drain some pasta in it later? I don't know, maybe, probably not, but still. Now, what I'm about to do might be considered a faux pas. If I can find a damn container. I'm having the problem that Claire has. I have too much crap in the fridge, and I gotta shuffle everything around. But chicken broth. 
needs a little bit more stuff, but it's whatever. Um, it's a little bit liquidy. Put it about half of what's there. Okay. He'll be like, use, you know, cooking Asian food. But am I really cooking Asian food? And I think that's part of the thing. That's the shtick. It's like, if you're cooking Asian food, I get it. But if you're using a rice cooker, just do whatever. Um, and I don't have chopsticks. I would like to get some chopsticks at some point. I know that they're very effective, especially at things like mixing and whatnot, even for cakes and the like. But a whisk does a great job, too. Now, granted, whisks are more of a pain in the ass to clean. I will grant that. Generally, you need to, you know, whisk it inside of some, you know, a container of soapy water, whereas you wouldn't need to do that with a pair of chopsticks. Especially if you've got some good, you know, industrial strength, you know, kind of like, uh, a chopsticks is basically like made the way this spoon is made. Um, hand carved out of like good quality wood. But whatever. We do it must because we can. I don't know. It's not really a, a necessary quote in this situation. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, Tremors holds up pretty well. I, I finished, I had started and then finished, um, Goodfellas. I started it like earlier this week. I want to say it was like maybe Sunday night. I'm not sure. Maybe a little earlier than that. I can't recall. But it just, uh. and, uh, it's a decent film. Like, some might would say decent. It's fucking good, fellas. It's Scorsese. It's one of the best films. Just like um, Raging Bull, it's phenomenal cinema. Um, you have great storytelling. You have great characters. The pacing is like, despite it being a relatively lengthy movie, the pacing is kind of okay at points. It's better. After I started watching it again, because I watched it for about 40 minutes um, the first time that I watched it, and then I stopped because uh, it just wasn't getting into it. And then I watched it, you know, kind of as homage to Ray Liotta since he died. Um, and I was like, why not finish it? Fuck it. And, you know. It's a solid film, of course. It's not something that, like, I have no reason to rewatch it. It's not something that I would rewatch. And that's what, you know, one of the things that kind of makes me realize, like, even though I decided to stay in LA, and I like breaking down films and stuff and talking about it like that, I'm not that guy when it comes to film you know I was listening to uh, Scrubs podcast the rewatch podcast earlier on my way back and um, they were talking about you know Zach was talking about how he was at this party and uh, you know like Tim Roth was there and Al Pacino was there and he was at a table with Al Pacino and they were talking about stuff and his, his career and all that crap and uh Tim Roth was talking, you know, because like Al Pacino, if you're if you're in like this itchy ass, that's <sighs> so what happens when you're a hairy person and you have to sit on your ass a lot, or you choose to, whatever. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> apparently, there's like this small little club that he does, and you gotta you know, it's invite only type thing, and he he does uh, 35 millimeter print viewings of films that he's done before in the past, but you know, not a lot of his big stuff, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, that all sounds really cool. It really does. 
But at the same time, I'm not finding myself hunting for that. And while it is a really good social endeavor, it works out really well for, as a social endeavor. You know, talking about film really is a great way to socialize with people. Um, and the more you understand film, personally, I think, the better it is when it comes to socializing and talking about film. Um, it's one of the reasons why I took film classes in the first place is so that I could understand these things so that when I do have a conversation about a film, I, I, I have an understanding of why I like something versus why I didn't like something. I honestly think everybody should try to do that when possible. Um, the visual arts of all kinds, if, if you even remotely enjoy them, Definitely do something to expand your understanding of what is happening. Take film classes, take some acting classes. You, you don't have to do it thinking that you're going to go into the industry or anything. But maybe you might after the fact. You might fall in love with it. I don't know. But like, if you listen to Zach Braff talk about film, he's been doing it since he was a kid. Like, he's always been a, a, a photog. He's always been, you know, a shutter bug in some capacity or another. And, you know, he enjoys a lot of the process, and there's a lot of it that I tried to do and I can't enjoy. And I, I get it. The more that I listen to him and various other people when it comes to talking about the way they like doing things, you know, Listen to Adam Savage talk about how, you know, his life when it comes to um, being in film and associated with film. Like, the man finds a thing in a movie and then obsesses over it for so long. And I'm like, I don't know how that's possible. I'm jealous of the fact that he can do what he does. Now, of course, he's a success story. You know, survivorship bias. But that's also kind of the thing, too. It's like... How many people are out there who are like me, just, you know, kind of maybe thinking about stuff like this, versus how many people are in it, that feel it, that think it, that breathe it? And in a lot of ways, the advice of If you're not sure that you want to go into, you know, acting or filmmaking or whatever, don't. It seems, it seems cruel. It also seems a little bit like pretentious, but if you really think about it, if you really give it some real thought. It is, in so many ways, a very exclusive industry. And it's not so much that, like, just because you don't know somebody doesn't mean anything. It's like any other industry in that, you know, the more people you know that have pull in one way or another, the more likely it is that you'll be able to get what you want and, you know, parts and working on certain endeavors and what have you. But it's exclusive in the sense that a lot of the people, a lot of them, devote so much of their life to being able to have a chance at it. Why is it there are so many people who are struggling actors that are, you know, in dead-end jobs, like working, you know, like one might say dead-end, you know, it's like being a waiter or a bartender or whatever. And in a lot of ways, those jobs aren't dead-end. But like, those aren't jobs that I could do anymore. I, I'm past that point. I might have been able to do them when I was younger. But I might not have either. I don't know. 
So there's people who are older than me, sure, who are still holding out hope. They're still doing it because it is something that they, for all intents and purposes, can't live without. And so they will do whatever it takes to be able to continue to audition, uh, to read plays, to buy plays, etc. Like, there, there's, a, like many things, there is, if you will, a spectrum of obsession in the realm of acting or just media in general, media production. an actor, somebody who wants to work on the, the tech side, or if they want to if they want to be, you know, a maker and, and build stuff for sets, or if they want to build sets themselves, what have you. If they just want to be a camera person. I've met so many people like that out here. And every one of those people that I can think of, and it, it wasn't even necessarily just film either. It was... I mean, I spent most of my time in, you know, film, television, TV, you know, film, television, radio related stuff, plays, etc. Um, at the school, and that was where I met most of the people that I knew, but like, most of the people that I knew that were at least moderately obsessed about the thing they were doing we're, st we're doing it and we're in some level, uh, they were some level of successful. Whether it was in the radio, whether it was in plays, whether it was in musical, whether it was, you know, tech stuff, whatever, it didn't matter. Column specialists, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's the stuff that they like doing and they were good at. And I'm super jealous of that. I really am. Or envious, whatever, it doesn't matter. The word has lost all meaning for all intents and purposes because we're using, we're using two words for basically the same thing. But my point is, I've been around those people. And hell, as I've said before, I'm not trying to hard, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or anything. But I got discovered, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't dedicate what it took to be that kind of success. So now, for the time being, if I'm working a few days in a row, like I happen to be right now, um, because I took, like last night I wasn't scheduled, but I took over somebody else's uh, slot, overnight slot, and then I'm also got Monday, but I'm also scheduled tomorrow, and I'm also scheduled Sunday, and so I was scheduled Thursday as well, so I have five straight days. Well, I don't have, but like, maybe if I'm lucky, three and a half hours to myself that are mine. Because I got at least, I've got eight hours of work, and then before work, I got to get ready for work, and so I give myself an hour for that, so that, I, you know, I don't completely screw myself over, and then I give myself approximately two hours for transitioning, i.e. commute. So that's an extra three hours. That work has essentially taken. And then there's the other, anywhere between an hour and a half to two hours getting back home. And so just for the sake of work, 
I've got an extra five hours for the sole purpose of commuting. So that's 13 hours in the day. Just for work. And then if I want to actually be able to re be well rested, which, you know, I do my best to try, I sleep at eight hours. That's 21 hours. So I can spend two hours, it's just about nine o'clock, so I've got a little bit extra time because the trains and everything just happen to work out, work out in my favor today. Um, and you know, I was able to, I didn't get anything to eat uh, from the kitchen today. I had a little bit of food when I was at work. cheese and strawberry preserves some butter let my sour cream sit out a little bit longer than I wanted like it sat out while I was asleep so you know Not forget this. Again, it smells like vanilla ice cream. It's crazy. Like a vanilla made milkshake, really. It smells great. Do it. something at work that can help uh, fill me out. Minimize my, my hunger cravings. I mean, you know, it's a bunch of protein and fat with not a whole lot of sugar because most of the sugar comes from the milk. Like, Total one sugar per serving, and I put two servings in here, so. And then I let it sit in the fridge, because then it, you know, settles and mixes well. Potatoes. I'm hungry. And I want some potatoes. Gotta use that bacon fat up. Delicious. So I learned a little bit more about uh, parboiling. Um, use this for my rice. 
Like that. So with um, so with parboiling, I don't have to boil them nearly as long as I thought. And then on top of that, to make things easier, pull you over here, get you out of the way. Um, don't have to boil them for nearly as long, but I also have my, uh, I was also baking my potatoes too low. I was only putting them at like 350, 375. And apparently it's better if you just cook them at like 500. So just put them in for, you know, I just put the thing in here and... Preheating the oven that is at the moment. Get a spoonish, forkishness. Push you guys, squish you a little bit. I wanted to break a little squash bladder. Let's get some more surface area on them. And I can flip them later too. I think at this point, I don't know, maybe I've said all I need to say. I'm probably gonna run out of time and battery soon, I don't know, and plus it's gonna get hot. So have fun.